Let me take just a second to introduce our next speaker. Uh, but first, let me um, let me let me give our, our first speaker a little bit of crap. I did tell him as usual. This is about a twenty minute to thirty minute talk. Um, I actually told John, dude, you're the co-author of the DevOps Handbook. You talk as long as you want. So uh, we're going long tonight. I hope you're ready. Grab another beer. Um, and, and even after that, don't even wait. Just come over here and cut you a piece of cake. Be the first. It's not, it's not going to hurt anybody. Um, John's got a couple of really amazing things going on. First off, if you haven't read the DevOps Handbook, go get it today. I mean, order it tonight before you leave. It, okay, number one, it's a handbook. It's not a narrative like the Phoenix Project. It's a handbook. Uh, if you trace everything that you're doing into this handbook, you're going to be more successful than you are today. Guaranteed. It's an amazing, amazing book with all kinds of insight. Now, speaking of the Phoenix Project, John sat down with Gene and did this really cool thing called the Beyond the Phoenix Project. This takes us back decades and gets you the history of, of how this movement came together. What are the, the, the solid foundations that this is built upon? If you haven't had a chance, it's, a, it's, a, it's obviously a very short book, a quick read. Now It's, a, it's an audio book and uh, quite a few hours long. Uh, it's incredibly informative, incredibly insightful, and I would recommend it to everyone. Go check that out. It's, uh, it's really great. So with that, I would like to welcome John Willis up to, uh, up to the stage to, uh, to talk to us about security and compliance theater. John. Is that oh, great. There you go. That's pretty loud. Uh, the clicker. Great, thank you. That was a great presentation on GitHub. It was really good. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, okay, I'll try to go kind of fast. So don't keep you here too late. It's a work night or a week night. That's me. Um, I'm Bachkaloop. Is like that's where I hang out usually. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. Um, this was DevOps Days Austin, so that was sort of fun. Um, we did a sort of karaoke band with real instruments. I, I, I want to step back for a second. Um, my brother-in-law um, flies A-10 fighter pilots, so now he's retired, but he, um, he was first in in both Iraq wars, and there's probably very few people on this planet I respect more than him. And I was so guilty that he, um, I'll fix that, uh, that like, he obviously protects our country, right? And, and like, I do nothing, eat a lot of food. Um, and then it was about 20 years ago, there was a a program called Mill OSS, and I got invited to do a whole bunch of presentations, contributions, and they gave me this coin, and I didn't know what the coin was all about. Uh, then somebody explained it. I go around and say, "Oh, look at this coin I got," and he explained to me like how that works, right? So I was like, "Oh my God!" So that one Christmas, after I found out how that coin worked, I threw it down to my brother-in-law, and it was one of the most exciting. Like, it just felt me, and and to that point, I am honored to be here. Um, and, and to JD, I've said, although it took us two years to get this worked out, I'd love to help, you know, because I, just like the, the way I felt about that contribution, you know, uh, you know, I, any way I can. Anyway, and maybe this presentation helps. Um, I've done a lot of things. I, I, uh, now six weeks ago, I went on Red Hat. Uh, I've been independent. I've, I've done 10 startups. I sold a company to Docker. I sold a company to Dell. I was early in at Chef. So I've just done a lot of things, a lot of startups. And uh, Andrew Schaefer, who's one of the sort of the, you know, the captains of our sort of DevOps industry, if you will, uh, talked me into creating a new program office at, at uh, Red Hat. And so Kevin Baer, who's the co-author of the Phoenix Project, Jay Bloom, Andrew, and myself, have a, a new um, program office um, it's in a synergy group. So I'm not sure exactly what that means. but. Um, but we're really trying to sort of figure out how Red Hat can sort of expand and, and get, you know, sort of the meta that we've been doing in the industry, see if we can help a little bit. Uh, yeah, here's the sort of bigger picture of the, the whole thing. Uh, also, all my presentations, I'm a little behind right now, but like 10 years of my presentations are out in my uh, a GitHub project, not GitLab. How do you like that? Um, yeah. So... Uh, um, so I'm going to come back to this in a minute. This is a project that I did 
maybe that's going to work a little better. Um, oh, yeah, so what Gene Kim does, I, I've been fortunate. I've known Gene for, so Gene was about halfway done with the Phoenix Project when I met him. It took him 10 years to write the Phoenix Project. And uh, we, had, we met actually at South by Southwest and we had this conversation about DevOps. And he wasn't completely sold on DevOps at that point. And, um, and he says that I helped him sort of change his narrative of the Phoenix Project. And then obviously Gene has done incredible stuff with that course correction I gave him. But one of the things he does, not only identifies DevOps Enterprise Summit. How many, how, JD, how many years now you've been going to the DevOps Summit? Two years, yeah, so. The Enterprise Summit, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was more than two or four, yeah, so. Um, it's an amazing event. It's, it's, the focus is enterprises, so it's not really sort of um, a lot of sort of startups and stuff. There are startups there, but the focus is uh, meeting large companies that are doing what you do. So if you're in financials, you're insurance or government, um, but one of the things Gene did about five years ago is, uh, maybe even six, is we started going to Portland about um, in sort of early April to think about the hard problems. So we invited about 40 or 50 people to Portland for three days, and we work on these sort of hard problem research projects. And there's about 40, and it's, it's all the largest industry people, um, you know, Disney, Jason Cox and Disney, Capital One, um, Barclays, you didn't name the company. Um, some of the authors up there that, that were mentioned in the previous books. Um, and we work on these projects. So, and normally go there and we do sticky notes and, and people sort of sticky vote or come up with ideas. But I, for about two years, I've been, um, so I left Docker like two and a half, three years ago. And um, I kind of, I've been, I was talking about Dev, DevSecOps from the early days of sort of how that thing got started. It's actually Shannon Leeds who coined it over at Intuit. She's incredible. Uh, if you want to see incredible research, incredible work, um, I don't think there's anybody on the planet doing more um, interesting stuff than Shannon Lee said into it. She runs a 75-person red team. When I tell that to banks, they're like, wow. You tell that to the top three or four banks in the world, they're like, how do they do that? <laughs> you know, um, I'm like, I don't know. You're, they're like uh, 10 times your market cap. <laughs> you should be asking that, answering that question. Um, but anyway, I don't heard you. So, I kept seeing this theme of like what we were doing with security. So DevSecOps, big word, right? And you know, a lot of people have sort of attitudes towards, you know, is it the right word, is it the wrong word? And then, okay, so we start thinking about putting more security in sort of this DevOps machinery that we have, right? And that's all good. But the thing I started seeing really clearly is that our, and I, I, I'm not, I don't think suck is a curse word, so that's the worst word I'll use today, but like, our audits, you know, I don't know the military, but in financial institutions, our audits are just horrible. They suck. Uh, in fact, one of the things I did over the last two and a half years is meet with CIOs and go spend a month with their company and go back to CIO and say, your audits are baloney. And you want to get a CIO riled up, right? And, and so I, I started thinking about, like, why is this? And so I'll come back to this. So my project for this was that I wanted to go ahead and get the smartest people I knew, and Gene gives you this sort of opportunity, this are all gonna come there anyway. So I got to pick like the Nike and um, Marriott, uh, and you know, so Marriott, the person I work for Marriott, right, runs like $60 billion worth of Marriott revenue through Kubernetes, right? Uh, so, I, the, so the team, Marriott, um, uh, Nike, uh, Capital One, um, just um, the, the guy who's running Sabre, Mike, Mike Nygaard, we got together and we worked three days on this idea of how do you build automated governance. And so this is a Creative Commons book that's out there for free right now. So it's downloadable from IT Revolution. So how did I get there? I left Docker like two and a half years ago. I thought, okay, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do all this DevOps handbook tools and uh, lean value stream mapping. And what I found was that to, in order to get the, the truth of how an organization worked, I had to stop using words like DevOps and lean and agile. Because they all sort of created, it was an abstraction. And it created a cognitive bias about why I was there. If I came in as the DevOps expert with the handbook, there was either sort of a negative or there was a, there was a positive or there was sort of a defense mechanism in place. And so I, I sort of came up with this idea that, you know, that the only way you get to really understand how an organization is sort of not succeeding at scale. Like anybody can go into a company and DevOps. There's enough videos, there's a couple of good books, one of them is yellow, um, to do DevOps. 
But the thing is, is the real problem is how do you get past that six, eight, or nine percent? Because when I travel to all these big companies, I don't see a company that's, I'll be generous, 20 percent. Now I'm talking Fortune 1000, maybe Fortune 5000. I don't see any company that's DevOpsing past 20 percent of the organization, and that's being incredibly generous. Usually it's down about six or seven percent. So the real problem isn't like how do you put in the Alaskan suite and get it to work? The real problem has you get the other 89 or 93 percent of the company to start working this way. And one of my theories, I mean I have a couple of theories, I think the DevOps dojo rightly done is the right way, but also is that nobody's going in and listening to all the people that do the work. Right? Nobody's having honest conversation with the thousands and thousands of people that are actually putting their fingers on the keyboard and asking them how the how do they do work? How do they do things? So I started this thing and it kind of devolved you know, from my fancy all my toolbox to what I, somebody named it to me, what it, they called it um, organizational anthropology. Where I, I got to the point where no tech. Like I'll spend a month in a bank and never touch a keyboard and then present to six or seven CTOs about how their security is terrible and nobody will actually argue with me. Right, and, uh, and it's all because I just have these sort of low-tech discussions with all the people that sit doing the work. And that's the truth. And so what I found is that as you go through these sort of questions, the things I was looking for, I started seeing these patterns. And, you know, I made it seven because seven's a cool number. The deadly diseases, people like to invite you to speak places because you gave it a cool name. But the truth was there were seven, there were patterns, and there were seven that worked out really well. Like, and, and, and I have longer presentations about the other seven, because this one I want to focus on. And, and the other thing is, I'd like to tell you and lie that said I was a genius and I knew how this was all going to unfold. The truth of the matter is, they all just, at the end, turned in to be funneled down to this. That their security and their compliance and all that stuff just was not true. It wasn't, their audits were, were wrong. Uh, their audits had incredibly low efficacy. They took forever to, to happen. And so, um, again, as I went through these sort of questions, and I won't do that now because there's a lot of time, but asking people how they really do work. It would it, always be funny to me, I'd walk in, and what I do also is I get people in their sort of natural habitat. Because one of the mistakes we make with sort of even the handbook and all, we, we go right to sort of a lean or DevOps practice. We'll take everybody, I know people heard lean value stream mapping, right? And it, it's, a, it's a great exercise, but, but it's way too early. Because we're taking all these people from different groups, putting them in a room, and we're getting some level of truth about sort of mapping how the value stream works, where the waste is. But we're not getting the whole truth, because you only get the real truth is when you, only, you talk to the development team one on Monday and spend a whole day with them. Because it, it takes me about an hour to get to where I'm part of the gang. You know, I'm, I'm, we're in the water cooler discussion. I mean, my funny thing is normally I'll, I'll ask, like, where does work start? And everybody's like, what do you mean by that? I'm like, I'm, I like playing the Columbo character too, right? Well, what I mean is, where does work start? And then, and then they're like, well, that's a really, really difficult question to answer. I'm like, really? Okay. And we argue for about an hour about where does work start? And then finally, I used to get mad. Now I know it's sort of a cliche. I'm like, okay, it's Monday morning. You open your laptop. You go to do something. Where did that come from? And they're like, well, you must know. Right now, all of a sudden, we're like into, now I can ask any question. I can ask percentage of stuff that's not documented. Why did you take this work from Joe, but not Sue? And why did you not create a Jira ticket, right? And, and again, I will go into all this stuff, but it sort of magically funnels down to, to really, at the end of the day, there is, there's really sort of a nonsensical um, GRC going on here, you know, governance, risk, and compliance. So there's this great story. So part of that is, is talking to all the people who do the work. But part of it is, um, you know, for those of you who read The Phoenix Project, it's actually based on a book earlier uh, by a guy named Elliot Gorat called The Goal. So Gene actually, his, his tenure mission was to create a modern day version of this manufacturing book called The Goal. And Elliot Gorat has always talked about, like, how do you sort of find the things behind the things? You know, so if I ask you a question, like, how good is, like, you'd never do this, but how good is your system? Like, well, it's kind of good, but you can't ask that. You have to sort of look for sort of these 
hidden ways to get information. And I think one of the greatest stories, I got this from Sidney Decker. I don't know if you guys have brought up some of the safety and resilience engineering people that have influenced DevOps, like Sidney Decker, John Osbar, and uh, Dr. Woods. Um, but Sidney Decker is a great writer, and um, he's got some great books we can list if you haven't listened to these books. We're like perfect for this space, right? Because it's, it's human factors, resilience engineering. These are people that study airplane crashes and hospital catastrophes, right? And they're system thinkers. But Sidney Decker does this great presentation about um, the Abraham Wall guy. So during World War II, there was, um, you know, there's always, uh, we all know about the Manhattan Project, but there was sort of another project going on actually in Manhattan that are like the smartest statisticians and mathematicians, and they were trying to figure out how to use sort of math and stats, mainly to repair planes that were coming, that had to go back. So they were literally going, you know, figuring out, okay, well, we put this weight distribution, and at one point, Abraham Wall was like, oh my God, we got it all wrong. We're trying to fix the areas where the bullet holes are. Those are the planes that are coming back. What we need to go is fix the areas where, the, where there are no bullet holes, because they're the ones that are not coming back. Right, so that's sort of the logic that I've sort of tried to use with companies. And, and, and every goal that, and, and, and here's a Beyond the Goal, which is a great audio book. Only in fact, it was the reason why I wanted to do Beyond the Phoenix Project, because Elliot Gorat wrote, uh, did an audio-only book. And by the way, never do audio-only books. You will make no money. Your best friends won't know that it is actually, thank you for so much for, like, rep that, like I even forget sometimes I have it. Um, yeah, audio books, not, audio-only books, not good. But the, in his, uh, the Elliot Gorat's the Beyond the Goal, which is incredible. Um, or at least if you think anything I've said so far is interesting, then it's incredible. Um, he asked this question about how social science and physicists think differently about complexity. So he asks, and he has an attached slide deck that you can use, right? And it's one of these slides. And he says, um, he says, who well, asked, like, which system do you think is more complex? And he said, most people and most social scientists would say it's, the, it's system B, of course. He says, a physicist says, no, no, it's system A. It's more degrees of freedom. And it's really, actually system B looks complex, but it's, it's as if I asked you, I'm sorry, I'm going to pick on you. You're like, yeah. Um, if I asked you how good or how accurate is your CMDB? You were, I'm not asking you that. I'm not going to put you on the spot. I know it's terrible. Uh, everybody's CMDB is terrible. <laughs> sorry. Um, but you're going to sort of like give me a system B answer. Most people will, especially if I'm an outside consultant, right? Like, it works. Like, oh, yeah, don't tell. I've had, I had a woman that managed all payroll for a 70,000 company, and she'd always say, like, as we're going through this thing, she'd say, guys, he's writing all this stuff down. And, but then, like, five minutes later, she'd just spill her guts about something, you know, about, you know some bypass that she did when payroll had to be done, right? Um, but you're always going to get that sort of system B answer and, and I need to look for the system A, right? I don't want you, it's, remember that slide earlier where I said you can't DevOps, you can't Agile, you can't lead your way at um, sort of bad culture or bad, but like that's, that, you know, when I walk in and say, like, DevOps, okay, we're done, let's move on. Like, we do that a lot now. I mean, that was a great presentation by uh, Robert. But like, no, I'm not gonna tell you, like, the, this DevOps thing sort of gets in our way, right? So to that point, this was going to be a transition slide, so, um, but, um, but, so, that system B is like the fine dog with no fire. How's your team B? I think it's okay, you know. Um, you know, how much work are you capturing? Ah, I think we're okay. What I really want to do is I want to find sort of the, the no degree, I want to eliminate all the sort of abstractions and, 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 you know, sort of cognitive answers that you're going to give me, and let's get to really what sort of, what is really going on? And so, like, what I find typically is most places are on fire, right? And so, this this was a transition slide too. So, so I'm just gonna um, JVD done a ton of work to put this together because I gave it to him in the wrong format. But so, what I start off with is the Equifax, right? So, it's one of the the Equifax, like, you know, um, person in charge of patching. Did you patch the system? So imagine that's the only thing on this slide right now. Like, yeah, that's a system B answer, right? Like, yeah, right, right sort of, kind of. It was Struts too. It was Jakarta, the, the 2017. The, the, actually, there was a five billion dollar market cap loss. They recovered a fair amount of that, but not all of it. 
Right, so like five billion dollar market cap trap, and like they did some funny money to get some of that like two billion back. So it's 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 like seven hundred million on paper, but but it's it's a lot of money that they lost, and it's not only that. All right, so I will run out of time. I lied about being short. Uh, is you know the worst thing that happened, which was the their auditor tortured everybody that worked there for a year, doing this thing, forcing them to prove the negative. Right. Um, Prove to me that your data wasn't corrupt. Our data wasn't corrupt. No, no, you have to prove to me that the data wasn't corrupted. Um, and for a year, a lot of people just quit. It was just, just horrible. And by the way, lost opportunity cost. They didn't calculate that. And in fact, it was in this rolling, like everybody was being pulled in every five minutes to prove this negative argument about the auditor being, you know, like panicking that there wasn't lost data. And by the way, the real breach hasn't come yet. You know, the Equifax, and I'll talk about the Capital One or the Marriott. The real one that's sitting out there that's going to happen, you remember in Marriott for four years before they knew that the uh, attackers were in their system? Equifax was like five to six months. The real one, and, and anybody who's gone through this will tell you 141 million records, thank God. Because what they're really afraid is if somebody can live in your site for about a year, they can actually corrupt your data and then possibly remove traces of that corruption. And maybe on some foreign black market or something actually do financial incredible damage to you. That's the real fear. That if these people, and these people are really smart. I won't get into that. The adversaries, you, you watch some of Shannon Leet's work and her research about how adversaries and how incredibly intelligent they are. And I, you know, I mean, no disrespect to static scanning, but like, that ain't what the smart people are doing. They're building polymorphic, malware that will basically not be detected unless it's on a live system. And if you put it on a test system, it won't expose itself. In fact, they just, um, four months ago, they found the first polymorphic um, crypto worm in a container image. And I guarantee you there's a lot more out there. Right? So that, 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 um, that, that Bitcoin operator one, the node one, that's a classic example of like the real bad actors now. That person got on a got on a, a open source node project because they knew that there was a, a Bitcoin operator that used that m method. And it took them a year to get to the point where they had committer rights. And once they got committer rights, they literally put their own sort of uh, malware inside of that library and it hit the um, Bitcoin operator. Right? So the thing is, though, one, answer, one question is like, okay, was it somebody patched the, uh, like, and, and by the way, that sort of the final answer was the person who should, the CIO basically said of Equus, the person who should have patched it didn't patch it, end of story. No, that's not end of story. By the way, that, that's the Jakarta breach right there. You do a curl to anything that's running that struts to vulnerability and that pound command equals, if that's on an authorized system from external, hitting external sort of um, Tomcat uh, container, you've pwned them. The kill chain has started, right? Um, and, and by the way, the, the, sometimes our, well, I don't say this, sometimes the Congress gets things right and wrong, but that 2018 report on the Equifax breach is brilliant. I mean, it describes incredibly well the kill chain, all the things that happened. But it also described a whole bunch of really interesting, um, sort of why it isn't as simple, back to system B, system A. Um, and there's all stuff in there. There's, 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 how many people heard of Conway's Law? Right? Conway was a, a, a computer programmer back in the 70s, or actually 60s. And, um, and Conway's Law is just sort of, um, sort of we, we use it a lot for when we talk about sort of, um, sort of going to microservices um, from monoliths. But it also it, it applies to really anything, organizational design. And uh, the idea is that organizations which design systems or constraint procedure designs were copies of the communication structure. Well, so in that report, there's some really interesting stuff, right? This was the org chart at the time of the breach for, um, for Equifax. Um, and, and anybody notice anything a little bit sort of weird about it? I don't ask, like, how many lines of code are in a Ford. Went a little bit easier than that, so. Uh, what? Yeah, yeah, brilliant, absolutely. Um, so, okay. The, the, the chief security officer reports to the chief legal officer, right? So there's, like, you can smell Conway's law coming in like a nasty sort of uh, hurricane cloud. So when, a couple of things. She was asked under Congress testimony, when you knew that the, uh, the PII data was 
basically the personal information data was uh, exfiltrated. Why didn't you notify the CIO? And the response was, I don't remember any particular reason. I just don't remember that. That's kind of law in its glorious, horrible, ugliest teeth. Because she was thinking about her responsibility for an organizational design structure that bound her to leave. In fact, it was even worse. The C I don't know exactly, but the CIO was about to go on a cruise for like three weeks. And had she actually worked with the CIO, she might have said, hey, you might want to postpone that. Right? Um, there's some other stuff there, too. There's, there's also, um, uh, there's this sort of, um, they asked her also, did you think when, she, when they hired her, they said, did you think that was odd that you would you're, you're a seasoned industry CISO, and she was. You know, they, they tried to blame it on her. That was nonsense. Um, but did you think that was odd? And, and she said, actually, and they, they call this uh, pluralistic ignorance. She said, I think that I thought they were Equifax. and knew what they were doing, so yeah, I just figured that's what I do. So this is another one where, like, the, the, the slide transitions to call the drama out of it. But the first thing you would have saw is the Capital One breach. Insider threat, 2016. Somebody, you know, yeah, that's one way to get a system B answer. First off, somebody working at Amazon, 2016, you didn't need that sort of knowledge to do the Capital One breach, because what really happened was there was a bypass. So what happened was Capital One is actually really good at sort of cloud and sort of DevOps, right? They're sort of a poster child. Here's the thing they didn't have. And, I, and this is external, not internal knowledge in any way, was they, they had this team got an exception process for whatever reason to go sort of out of process to do something. And they didn't have a process for out of process. Now, I, I know that sounds weird, but you have to have a process for out of process because that's what happens when you don't. They were like, okay, you got the thing, go for it. And they're like, now I'm sort of ad-libbing, but hey, who's used a WAF before? I did it two years ago. All right, let's do that one. Who knows, who knows how to set up an Amazon instance? I'll use the last one they use. So they wound up using a WAF that they took all the default configs, and they wound up going on an Amazon instance that was in an authorized group, and this one WAF didn't turn bypass off by default. So basically, something, something, capital one, URL equals, anybody know the what, 169254164? Anybody? Come on, the GitLab guys must know. Or get out, get up. No, the GitHub house. No. Um, it's the metadata server in Amazon. What, and, and by the way, there's a thing called a server side request forgery. And I will tell you this that, again, like anybody in Amazon, like you want to debate me and everything, if you fake your identity in Amazon, that's, that metadata service is the most dangerous thing there is. Some of the most major breaches have been caused the metadata server. Because once you can do a server-side request forgery, and, and the metadata server thinks you know who you are, you can just ask it for anything. And it will just tell you. So that attack was as simple as dollar sign URL, I mean, question mark URL, because bypass was turned off, and give me my, my WAF rolls from Amazon and credentials, and then they started just scanning S3 buckets, right? Um, so again, you did, like, a lot of times when I go into a company, like, I, I always say, you know, I, I thought I was being arrogant when I said, I wish I could have done this sort of forensic stuff in Equifax before the breach. And I'm like, yeah, John, you're so full of yourself. Like, and then I go to this large bank, a top five bank, and so, oh, one of the other beauties in that report, <laughs> this, is a, this is incredible, one of the beauties in that report is, all of the IDS, the intrusion detect systems that they must have been paying 10, 15, or 20 million dollars a year for, were all inoperative because they had expired search for 18 months at the time of the breach. Right? It's in the report. So it isn't just that thing. So I now go in this big bank and I'm like just whacking away at questions. I get some of the risks and security people. And I hear them talk about a legacy system for search. I'm like, oh my, I called Gene Kim. I broke, broke my NDA that night because I called, I called Gene. I'm like, oh my God, Gene, you're the only one I can tell this. They had a legacy system managed search, and whoever requested a search went in there, and it was their email that was supposed to get notified when it expired. And as we dumped out some of the things, he just showed me some of the things I didn't touch the keyboard. Um, there were a whole bunch of employees that had search registered for notification that didn't work there anymore. 
I said, where do those go? Bitbucket. No, my God, this is Equifax right here. So I, I, I wind up going in, and you know, it's funny, right? I, I go in the first day, um, and um, and I don't know if I'm going to do this with Red Hat or not, you know, but this is what I was doing independent. I mean, there's a lot of pieces of it I'd like to continue, but I usually support CIO. Um, I go in, and nobody wants to talk to me the first day, right? Like, and everybody makes fun of me because I'm just using sort of paper-based, you know, notepads. This company, basically, yeah, here we go. This company, one of the CTOs asked to buy this book at the end. And by the way, my last two weeks are like full to nine o'clock every night, right? Because now they realize there's somebody listening, and that's the thing too. Sometimes I go to companies, and when I'm done with the, the thing, I tell Sarah, you know, like. I know this is hard. This is a terrible, like 400 pages. And I, I'm nuts. I do summarizations and I got page numbers. So if you want to challenge me, or even if I challenge, I got a quote and a date for everything. Now, I never quote. The reason why I don't get, you don't get the book is I protect, I tell everybody, I'm going to write down what you said. I'm going to go out of my way to make sure that nobody knows who you are who said it. But, um, but you, you go through this and you have the, and you go to this, you know, and, and like if anybody objects, I'm like, okay, page, you know, 239 on this date, basically, this is what somebody told me, right? Like, like that's the people who do the work, right? There's no argument. So, so sort of getting into the deadliest disease, right, which is seven, right? I, I have longer presentations where I go through. So some of this stuff is really interesting, like finding how people think about complexity and failure, how they do, you know, how they do uh, sort of postmortems, you know, how they think about sort of incident response, all that stuff. It's like brilliant. Like it's a great like primordial soup of how bad you are. But you know, to keep this reasonably short, um, I just focus on the seventh deadly disease, which is the security and appliance theater, right? And, and I, I say it's just a, it's a magic funnel. When you ask all these questions and all these things, you just sort of get to the boilerplate, which is that you know your audits are nonsense. And so, um, just some things that you know, you know, kind of dev sec oxy or um, you know, rabbit head that sort of shift left, right? Um, you, I mean, one of the things that is symptomatic of how I always say, you know, I'll use the word suck twice, but your suck factor is a multiple of how many board reviews you have. Like, you got four review boards here, four x, five x. I mean, I've been to companies that have XML review boards. They so intertwined their software, their XML, you know, their job scheduling system that they actually have to have a global XML review board, along with their, you know, architecture review board and their product review board and, you know, the, the uh, source, the, the cab, right? Um, checkbox compliance, hidden workarounds, like, if you put obstacles, like the, the woman who did the payroll, right? I told you, she had payroll 70,000 people, and she said, you know, I'll fill out your ticket all the time, I'll play this silly game, I'll even use this four-year-old backup plan that no, I don't even change the dates. It's a PDF that I just reused. I mean, a joke like someone's like, call me if you read this, right? Which nobody reads it. Um, I'll do all that, and I know it's nonsense. But if I gotta get payroll out, and I don't think you're gonna get my change in payroll, I know how to fix the system, and I'll fix the system. So the bottom line is people will find the workarounds because they've gotta do the work. I mean, it was amazing how many people I'll ask, how many people in a, in, in a group I'll say, how many people know that this should be um, a change impact of major, but you make it minor no impact because you don't want to take more than a couple days? Every hand, every hand goes up. I've heard worse. I've heard people tell me on tiering systems that they'd actually bypass a tier zero system, like tier zero, your, your most highest priority, because to get a tier one and move it to tier zero is quicker and easier. I mean, it, I have got hundreds of these stories. Like, um, so the workarounds, you know, and then, and then the other thing with people, auditors, right? The, this is the thing is that, you know, I talk to people, they're like, you know, I'll risk people say, John, like, we don't tell auditors things they don't already know. Why would we do that? I'm like, well, because that was the whole point. <laughs> what was that TRC thing that in this large book that was stapled on some poster? Um, you know, and, and the other one is like, people tell me, well, if I had more policy, that's just another day for audit. I mean, this is how, and I have people actually tell me what's wrong with that. So when I present and I say, John, you said something about that. Like, we do that all the time. What's wrong with that? I'm like, sorry, get away from me. <laughs> I, I can't catch that cold you've got. Um, you know, um, vulnerability theater. I mean, here's the thing, right? You got to do status scanning. You got to do vulnerability scanning. And like, if you read sort of the sonotype uh, supply chain reports, it's just ridiculously scary. 
of the dependency map. And by the way, I don't care what you use, who you use, you're not going to catch the complexity of these dependency maps. It is just far too complex, even for the smartest. I mean, I do like the pattern matching stuff. That does make sense, like where you can look for patterns, and that does work. But, but at the end of the day, that's your sort of, like, to use maybe a metaphor for military, that's your boots in combat. That's not even your gun, right? Um, because the, you know, the, because the problem is, you have to do all that, and then signal the noise ratio on vulnerability scannings is incredibly terrible. Because the dependency, I mean, the, when, you, when you talk about, it, Robert was talking about the dependency, and so it's, it's insane. If you look at the struts too, in the in sort of the the Jakarta and then the methods in there, I mean, they, you, there was like methods in production systems that re literally are written by some person named Bob that are in your dependency chain. And some some scanners don't even go less than five levels, or more, more than five levels, right? I mean, and by the way, I've had people tell me, you know, those, you know, whenever you get into signal noise ratio, people get tired of hearing the the things like. Yeah, they keep sending me that I've got an SQL injection and I don't even have any database calls in my code. So you just noise them out, man. You're like, you know, other people tell me I send in whitelists and they never get updated. So these are human condition problems, right? Um, but you have to do all the things. And the other thing I talk about too is sort of, um, you need to think about, we, we talk a lot about ROI in sort of DevOps and, you know, what's the ROI? There's, there's this notion of what I call top line or bottom line ROI. It's not how much you save, it's how much you invest and make, right? Uh, so, like, well, a lot of people think about, like, like I can, you know, I can save, uh, the question isn't whether I spend a million dollars or ten million. The question is if I spend t one million and make five million or spend ten million and make three hundred million. Right? That's, that's how almost every other business in a company works. People have to sort of go in and say, make their sort of, well, I think we can do uh, you know, 17 or 18 percent on this investment. And I think we don't do that. We just flat out like, you know, in fact, a lot of banks who we run DevOps, they have this sort of from the CEO down called, uh, it's uh, run the bank, build the bank. So the people on the ground, they're doing all this incredible like, and stuff, and at the top at the budget, they literally bifurcate the budget into run the bank, which is not DevOps, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and, and change the bank, right? So, um, but this is, uh, this is an interesting, I did this for a regulated company a while back. Uh, actually, it was my first gig, actually, uh, coming out of Docker. And, um, like, you have to, this, this is basically the army outfit, maybe the um, bullet protector, the boots, and the helmet. You have to do all this. And it's not just static code analysis. I mean, you need to do DAST and SAS, and you need to do, you need to do, you need security people. I'm, I'm sure you are doing this, but you need sort of threat modeling concepts in, in security and design. How many people I talk to like to say, well, we don't let the security people come design because they ask too many questions. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason why they're asking those questions, right? And we find out like you're using the wrong TLS version down in production, right? Um, the, you know, so all the way on the left, requirements and you know, one of the things uh, I love about some of like, you know, even Sonatype or, you know, the, 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 their supplied IDE is incredible, like, you, uh, we did this workshop, it was a kill chain workshop with Sonatype and another vendor, and as we went in, we purposely put the Jakarta in a, in a like, motorcycle Java app, and we went through it, had developers walk through it, we actually got them to sort of attack the system, it was brilliant, right? But during, you know, I let each vendor go ahead and do a little demo, and during the Sonatype one, like in the IDE, it was brilliant. I mean, it really popped up red while they were in the IDE in Eclipse, and then it's kind of drilled in, and it told you not only that the, you know the sort of the stretch two vulnerability, it also told you actually that stretch two vulnerability had you defined the method libraries a certain way, it wouldn't have been a vulnerability, and that was actually defined in there. So all the things, all the way left to right, um, just some other stuff. I mean. Again, I don't know really how the military works from audit and all that stuff, but one of the things a lot of banks don't do is they just don't have that first order conversation with the auditors. Like if you're gonna do something new, and I'm gonna get to the last couple of slides about automated governance here. I, you have to, if you're gonna do automated governance, and I'll, it was that book I showed you earlier, and I'll explain it a little bit more. Um, you have to pull them in immediately. You can't do this sort of on your own and then say, hey, look what we did. You gotta sort of bring them in, you gotta bring them into the design. They have to be part of that discussion. In fact, they're gonna have ownership in it. They're gonna feel like they built it. They will have built it, right? And, um, you know, and, and you know, we'll talk about the subjective uh, and, uh, 
false positives. You have to get, you can't just rely on the fact that you spend $10 million on some scanning software product like White Source or something like that and it's done. It's, no, it's not done. There's a whole human element to figuring out people that tell you like they go to whitelist and never gets whitelisted. Like, or they get sort of false positives all the time and they get tired of reading it. Um, you know, it, I think most people got this one. You know, James Wickett says a bug is a bug is a bug. Like, don't use a different ticketing system for vulnerabilities than you do for, uh, if you're using Jira, then everything goes into Jira. Um, and then I love the inner source, right? Like, I, you know, there are certain repositories that probably can't, like, if you're sort of Barclays and there's only three people that wrote an algorithm that brings in a billion dollars worth of revenue a year, and this is a true story, um, you probably don't want to make that an open inner source repository, right? Um, but, but in general, unless it's not like that, then it probably should. I don't, you know, like the, the sort of the crowd, let people just see if there's reusable code, um, and then, you know, sort of educate. So the last part of this is the automated governance. And so I told you about that book, it's out there. Um, I'll try to finish up because most of it is in the book. I'm just going to repeat a lot of what's in the book. Um, but but uh, so I'll go through it a little class fast unless you want to stop me or we can have a drink and um, I can talk more about it. But the thing that I came to the conclusion was, and there was somebody who told me, this is a, a friend of mine who's like, you know, his whole career has been sort of security. Um, he's a white hat hacker. And he said to me, he said, the problem with most organizations is that they rely on subjective attestations for audits. And so subjective is basically your classic change ticket, right? You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a change. I'm going to document it. You know, Sue's going to review it. Bob's going to review it for production. They're going to maybe ask. And it's this telephone game of humans trying to describe an incredibly complex system, which is way, today reasonably impossible to do. You know, the, the, uh, most, most banks have five generations of technologies going from DB2 to operators and Kubernetes, right? And it's, just, and it's, it's the own envoy. Right? That, tell me the person who can look at it and say, yeah, uh, Bob, I think you got it. This is going to work. It, it just doesn't. So there's a subjective notion. And the order, what do the orders do? And I got in. I don't know what they do in the military. In the bank, they come in. I want to see this change record. And they go the remedy or something. And there's this whole discussion. And they're like, and then they pull everybody in, and they got to explain it and do this. And then they ask for screen prints because they still don't even trust the subjective nature. And then, okay, good. And, and what we need to do is, and so an attestation is really proof or evidence that you've sort of, you've complied with your governance policies, right? Your governance risk and co compliance, right? So that you, your attestation is some type of evidence and the subjective nature of what most everybody does is a human conversation. And so this thing I started a couple of years ago where I sort of got motivated and, and I, I started working with some banks and, and, and I got, Gene allowed me to work on this project with the team. That was sort of the crescendo of like, let me see if I can really get this to work. And we created a reference architecture and we got it working. And, and I'll walk through it. But the idea is that why, why do we have humans in this conversation? Why can't we just create like SHAs? Now, I'll say the word blockchain because there ain't a better word for it. But it doesn't have to be blockchain. I mean, blockchain freaks a lot of people out for all different reasons. But the point is, what I want is an immutable list of SHAs with a final SHA. So when the auditor comes in, I can say, this is immutable math, pal. And like, if it's broken, it can't be broken. Because if it is everything else, like quantum supremacy has happened, right? Uh, like, it, like you, you can't, you know, I mean, RSA encryption is at least safe for 10 years, folks. Uh, but, um, but the, um, the, that's math. I mean, like, and, and, and we've already talked to some auditors about this, and they're like, yeah, this is cool. You're right. Like, it is, like this, everything else we use in financials is based on sort of this model. Like, so I can walk in, and I can turn a 30-day audit into a half a day. And guess what? The big five like this. I thought they weren't going to like it. They're like, no, no, we're going to start the same amount of money. We'd love to put our people in there for one thirtieth of the time. Right? And so, so this idea that you build these attestations from that same policy, and if you get the policy people, or the auditors, or the policy people, typically the policy people are the translators of sort of your governance risk compliance, you get them to help shape, and I know a couple of banks that are doing this brilliantly now, and, and it starts exposing so many more second order opportunities. I don't have the time to tell you all this, but, um, so the goal of that reference architecture that we built, it was really threefold. One was, all of my DevOps sort of sister and brethren go in and we say, CIO, get rid of the cab. 
And they're like, yeah, but how? I got an audit that I got to do. And I can't re the cab is the only malleable way that I can do an audit. And so A, we wanted to be able to create a reference architecture where we could prove that this might be an alternative to the cab, that you could really have you know, objective attestations in some chain. Second, I already expressed that we wanted to show that we could turn a 30-day audit into a half day. And third, my whole thing that your sort of audit suck, I want to take your sort of efficacy of an audit from anywhere low 20s to like high 90s. Right? So that was the goal of this book, you know, or research. And actually, it was actually started from Capital One. Capital One, uh, in 2017, wrote this brilliant blog article, and I just scrolled down to, it was called Creating Better Pipelines. And, um, and in there, they, de they described how you got auto-approved on change tickets. And the way they did it was, they said, if you can evidence, I think it was originally 17 uh, control points, um, I didn't originally call them gates, but then uh, in the future called control. We call them control points in the uh, in our document. If you could evidence these 17 or 16, 16 gates, then we will give you auto approve. And that just started for people like, how did you guys get auto approved? Well, if you if you put in, and in fact, not too dissimilar how SRE works, right? And again, don't get me started on SRE. But but the point is, there, there's some good things about it that you, the way you get SRE managed in a perfect world is you have to evidence that you can have all these sort of NFRs, you know, non-functional stuff to manage your system. So this was the starting point, and then I started this conversation. Like, if you're for, if you're already forcing people to put these in there, couldn't we just turn these into attestations in an attestation database? And that really started the whole. It was actually the JFrog people that got me sort of going on this as well. And uh, I was like, wow, great. Let's, and, you know, I fumbled with it for a while and then finally got um, that team together that wrote that book. And so what we did, which was, oh, Sam Guggenheim from Microsoft, right? Sam Guggenheim has like done almost every major security project at Microsoft for the last 20 years, right? Like, and, and so I'm sitting there literally with the hair on my arm standing up watching Marriott, PNC, PNC Bank was the other, PNC Bank, Marriott, Capital One, and Sam. And Mike Goddard, not only does he run Sabre right now, he's the guy who invented Circuit Breaker Patterns in a book called Release It. Right? I'm watching them sort of debate these attestations, these control points. And I'm just like blowing my mind with Sam was like, well, at Microsoft, we have to do this. And, and then, you know, Dwayne Holmes from Marriott would go, well, at Marriott, we have to have this. And so we actually wound up with a kitchen sink of about 75 attestations. No one company would do those 75 attestations. It was like, let's just throw them all in. The longest part of our sort of debate was to figure out how do we describe a pipeline? And we weren't trying to create the 101 version of a picture of the pipeline, right? Because there's a gazillion out there. It was, we were thinking about how could you stage it? And it took a half a day to do this with like experts. Because it was so important to get this right. Um, and, and so this is what we came up with was there were basically um, um, you know, uh, seven stages that worked for gating the stages for attestations, like how do you get to the next stage? And if you notice, dependency manager artifact is on its own sort of, it, you don't see this, but it's its own sort of cycle by itself, right? So because that has to have its own sort of gating process or, or attestation process as modules come in. Um, and then they also obviously interconnect in the process. So we went through every stage and the idea was we, you know, uh, we would sort of uh, SHA, you know, if it was something, even even human things, we would like, create like a button or something to SHA. But if it was like a build log, we tar it and SHA it and put it in the thing, uh, commit log. Like so anything that we could sort of create uh, an artifact for, you know, a pull request, peering on a pull request, right? So that it's documented that there was a peering on a pull request, right? That, that if you made that an attestation uh, or a control point for an attestation, like that became part of the chain. Right, and again, so we're going to come in and say, well, this is all the things. Here's the the one sort of again, I'll, I'll loosely call it a blockchain. Here's the blockchain. Like we're done. What do you want to see next? And then by the next or third one, it's like, okay, I get it. Right, because it's all the same. Right, it's just math. Um, and you have sort of a mutable record um, for the project. When I'm not sure that Graphics, Graphics is an open source project that Google created actually for this, for their open container registry. Um, I actually met with the developers and the team at, at KubeCon because there's some, it, it doesn't actually quite work for this model. So I don't know if they're going to sort of take our advice, but I would like this to be the project because it's the only single open source project that actually addresses this. 
Um, it's just uh, not to get into details, but the way they sort of address it didn't fit sort of our model of sort of a, it, it isn't blockchain-y. It's sort of individual attestations. You can't chain them together. Like we need to, for example, you'd want, I'm going way crazy, but I'll finish here in a minute. Um, you, like the, the model that we've sort of, and that's evolved. I work with a couple of banks now um, that evolved. Like, so what we see now, even that we didn't see then, is you're going to have a whole bunch of commits that are sort of unattached. And then at the time of the pull request, then you're going to, you do need to keep a change record. <laughs> we learned that, right? Okay. Like the change record is not going away. Like if you're using like, you know, ServiceNow or using Remedy or whatever, right? So but then the change record becomes sort of the attachment of everything. So all the commits now can bundle in there and everything that happens to the right from commit to prod, then become attestations. And you'll see the examples here, right? But so Graphius just right now can't create those sort of connection links. And uh, so, I don't know, maybe they're going to work with us. I'm trying to get about 10 banks together in January. And we, we should, like, if there's interest, we should do this in military. But the idea right now, I've got sort of verbal, loose verbal commitment that, um, that we're all going to show up somewhere. And we're going to focus on, like, how do we sort of take this, beyond, like, version two of this document. And so, here's the thing. The governance model is, every stage you saw has an input, output. Again, I'll go rather quick right now, unless anybody wants to stop me. Or it looks like everybody's, like, wanting to get out of here fast. But... Um, they had risk controls, actors, actions, input, output. By the way, oh, the, the woman, the, the code. Like, if there's a student in her thing that's like wants to get into how do you do work, how do you come work for you, give them this book. This is an incredible, because we went nuts. We, we defined all the attestations. We defined um, what they meant. So it's an education. This book by itself is just an education from about five or six major companies of all these things you would like, like you know, um, like it depends it has to be clean from an artifact repository. All the, and with, with pretty, like two or three sentences for every control point. I mean, it's an education by itself. Um, actors, actions. And so like here's the source code, right? The risks. Um, but the control points are what we were, the, the idea was those would become sort of the, the SHA base. You'd call something like Vault or whatever, or you just SHA and you start creating these SHAs. So like a peer review, some percentage of unit, coverage. Uh, ultimately, one of my sort of goals with this too is you could create templates. So like in the financial, like you could have a PSI DSS that could be basically blessed by a big five, right? And then you could have templates for sub whatever, right? Like, so like different things can matter, percentages, uh, you know, like so like if you had a unit test coverage percentage or um, clean dependency scan sensitive information, right? Again, right there. Did you scan for, for tokens or secrets? Was that done? It has been done. Now, they, somebody might get breakthrough. Uh, the other thing I learned, too, I told you an insurance company said, this, so if you have this whole attestation database and you have a shot that represents like seven, whatever your sort of magic number is, um, one of the things I didn't realize when we were building this that is in sort of a side benefit of this is if you actually have a breach, you have a complete evidence chain unlike anything you've had before. Because now, now you just basically... Um, you, you just basically dump the whole attestation data store, and now you know like the module that was in, what the SHA is for that, and you can you can drive the breach down and find out. Talk about shifting left. Why didn't we catch this secret? Oh, it was some weird XML token we'd never seen before, right? Um, but like, imagine how long that takes when you don't have this tight evidence chain, right? So, um, you know, the build stage. Um, I'll just go through the control points. The build came from source, right? Yes, yes, has to come from source. It's a mutable build on output. It's got to be a mutable output. Um, upstream approved defender store, right? So we know that we, that we don't, there's no man in the middle. Like we've got all, like we know who we're getting it from. And then like later I'll, I'll go quickly, but the defender store has, uh, it knows where it's getting it from, right? Like, so the chain of evidence of, of your artifacts are, at least from an evidence perspective, are incredibly clean. Um, Unit test and linting, security, output is going to be artifacts, the bomb and build logs, the dependency measure. So now this is a loop on its own, but we're in the stages we're going back to it as well. So control point is download only from approved external supporters. Does that not look good for your military repositories? Um, and you probably already have this license check, security check. All there, right? Like I got to have a you know, license check. Now I got an attestation that says I have it. So if there's a question about licensing and some vendor's trying to charge you a gazillion dollars, Right? Like, it's there. Or you get a lawsuit. Um, 
age. Like this is one of the, one of the vendors, uh, one of the companies that said, we have to have an age check. How long has it been in the repository? There's a limit of, we, it's stale. So like the, that was one of the attestations that if it's over this age, then it's, it's, it's got to be refreshed. Right, so the build would actually go red, right? Like, um, approved versions, um, package stage. So another thing, we realized we had to have a package stage because the truth of the matter today, um, in general, everything becomes a package, right? It's either, so, in general, we're talking about enterprise software for the most part. It's either a sort of a jar file or some type of Java file. It's, a, um, it's basically a container image, right? Or now maybe a function. Right, but like, so we realized you had to, there was enough sort of in the industry that package merited its own sort of stage as a thing that we can look at from an attestation model. So like, did the package come from a trusted dependency model? At this point, um, was it vulnerability scan? Um, if it's sort of image based, like, you know, maybe using notary or something, and you, you, you have a sort of a, um, a, 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 author, a, a fingerprinted image, Right, so imagine that, everything's immutable from left, the fingerprint is, you have the attestation that's fingerprinted, like the SHA points to the fingerprinted SHA. I mean, what, like, what more does an auditor have to see? Like, and the answer is basically nothing. Um, unique version, truth of medical data. So, um, you know, it, it only does Netflix, right? They would actually create these sort of blanket AMIs, they put them in an artifact repository. There's some great articles about the sort of Netflix with Lego blocks, whatever. And then they would populate all of the image when it ran from something like a zookeeper that would sort of put all of it, not everything, but they could minimize their sort of image types because they could do run time population of metadata. So, so for things that, this kind of, I won't get too crazy, but this is kind of what made Chef so popular early on is over, over Puppet, which it, it was really good at sort of overlaying metadata so you only had to have, you know, one recipe for Apache as opposed to in some puppet clients had 3,000 <laughs> recipes or a manifest for Apache, right? So it's that sort of model that you can sort of consolidate if you can populate at runtime through some metadata server process. So in their world, you have to have like sort of TLS to, the, to the, whatever the metadata server that was providing. So I knew that I, it couldn't be man in the middle, right? Because then like that's dangerous, right? Somebody might poke in the wrong um, IP address or database or whatever, right? So. Anyway, so on and on and on, um, artifact stage. Uh, it's all out there. When you get the prod, right, um, there was a non-prod stage. So you get the prod, right, and then you can see that now, we, now we're heavy hitting, right, because we're going to prod, but uh, trusted source in the artifact, a lot of configuration. Oh, configuration management, right? There's another whole, I mean, we're talking about this dangerous vulnerability area in today's world, right? YAML files and Docker runtime config definitions. Right, like we don't, people don't even understand the complexities of the sub-complexities. I mean, there's, uh, Liz Rice has a great presentation where you can basically put on a whole bunch of security flags in a Docker config definition and they'll all get no op if you don't turn the security flag on Kubernetes. Right, so, um, you know, uh, by default we run a Docker container, it doesn't set up a user namespace. So that means that you are, by default, this was in the early days of it took a lot of hits for this because by default, you are in the, the namespace, or not even namespace, you are the user of the host. Well, they fixed that about three or four years ago. But by default, it doesn't get turned on. You have to specifically add that as a flag. So if you don't add that default flag, you literally are running with the, de you're, you're not sort of isolated in a namespace and the user in a container. So I'd be running root on the host and Bob on a container if I use the uh, flag, but if I don't turn that flag, I mean, there's hundreds of these things of configuration that can just so sort of wipe you out. YAML and configuration definition is the, and the, the adversaries are figuring this out really fast. It is the, you know, I mean, the struts to the Java, all that stuff, and the, the real danger zones right now are the, um, by the way, cloud is cheap for adversaries. Like, like 20 years ago, the defense of us against adversaries it was relatively easy because they didn't have the compute power we do. They can get FPGAs on Amazon. They can run everything that we're running today from a middleware structure that we run. They couldn't do that 15 years ago. Like, so their, their ability to catch us and catch up and get ahead of us is incredibly dangerous. And we've gotten really lazy in sort of the fast pace. I'm not, I, I love Kubernetes. I worked at Docker. I sold a company. I think it's the only way to go in the long run. But we are right now, um, the cloud native and GRC 
are so broken. You know, what we're doing from a cloud, I say, I said in my presentation in DOS, like, on the sixth floor you have sort of the, 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 um, the service management, idle people, seventh floor you have the DevOps people, the eighth floor you have the cloud native people, they use different elevators, they use the same terms with their different meanings, and they never talk to each other. That is the state of our world right now. The separation between what people are trying to do in sort of service mesh, Istio, I'm not even getting into sort of functions as a service, is so far divorced from what our sort of book says GRC is in our company, that it's broken beyond repair. And, and we're moving so fast with configuration and YAML and all this stuff that doesn't even have time. Anyway, um, that's it, I'm done. Okay, John, thank you so much for coming out. Um, okay, what a great turnout. I want to thank everybody for coming out and joining us tonight. I hope uh, you found this as really exciting and informative as I did. Um, as always, we kind of start uh, end with uh, some, some resources that we highly recommend for everybody um, in this domain. Um, all of this is, a, uh, you can check out our website, everything's listed, direct links to Amazon. Go, uh, if you don't have it yet, go buy your DevOps handbook, it's amazing. Uh, we are doing a book club. Uh, we've got, I want to thank Tech Systems for, uh, for chipping in. We've got 20 copies of the brand new Unicorn Project from Gene Kim. Uh, if you've read the Phoenix Project, it's kind of operations focused. Um, the Unicorn Project kind of takes that next step and looks at the dev side of this. Uh, a couple of new characters, but your favorites are, are there as well. And uh, I can tell you, it, it's a novel just like just like the, uni the, the DevOps, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Phoenix Project was. And it's, uh, it's actually a really good read. Uh, it probably took me two days to get through it. It's a great read. And if you're anything like me, you read through it and you think, oh my god, I think I work at Parts Unlimited. Why can't I make the progress that they're making? So, uh, especially for our regulars, uh, the only thing I ask, I have two asks for the book club. Uh, please come back next month and discuss it with us. Uh, it won't be a two hour show, I promise. And uh, in each book, we're trying something new for this, this book club, you'll find a library card. At the top it says read and share. So whenever you get your book, put your name in it, and then when you're done, hand it to the next person who needs it, who you think can benefit the most. Uh, see if we can get these uh, all around town and, and really help change the way people think about how we work uh, in our industry. With that, we normally do a lean coffee. It's kind of late, maybe we won't do that this time. Um, if you haven't done the link coffee with us, please come back in January. It is a great, great exercise. Um, and with that, we are done. Thank you so much. <laughs>